Well, we are continuing in the book of Genesis, as we do. We like to study books of the Bible here at Revolution Church, and we go verse by verse. And we're in chapter 43 this morning, and I want to give you a little backstory before Eugene reads the scripture for us this morning. So right now we're in the life of Joseph. Remember Joseph? His, he was the father's favorite. Jacob played favorites with his kids, which is not recommended, by the way. And he, what did he do to show his son that he was the favorite when he was young? Remember? Yeah, he gave him a coat of many colors. What did, did that make his brothers happy? No, no, they were really ticked off. They were so mad at Joseph, they wanted to kill him. In fact, they threw him into a dry well, and they, they argued about killing him. And of course, one of the brothers, Judah, says, hey, if we kill him, we don't make any money. Let's sell him. Let's sell him into slavery. And he got sold into slavery. And a guy named Potiphar bought him. And he did so well as a servant in Potiphar's household that Potiphar put him in charge of everything. His finances, his employees, everything. The only thing he kept back from him was his wife. And, but his wife had eyes for Joseph. And so she kept making advances towards Joseph. And Joseph kept refusing. And so one day she kind of arranged things where only he and her would be the only ones in the house. And, uh, and she made a very forward advance towards him. And he left behind his jacket and ran out of the house. She used the jacket as evidence to say that he tried to rape me. And so what happened to Joseph? He got put in prison. But even in prison, in the worst situation, he works his way up. He basically becomes assistant warden to the prison. He's in charge of everything. And then he, uh, two guys get cast in prison. One was the cupbearer and one was the baker for Pharaoh. And they, uh, they had these bad dreams. Well, one of them was a good dream. One was a bad dream. And they said, we don't understand our dreams. And say, J- J- uh, Joseph said, well, I can interpret them for you. God will tell me what it means. And he told him. And of course, one guy meant he's going to die. Another guy is going to live. And he told the guy that's going to live, hey, when you get back to Pharaoh's administration, just remember me. You know, because I didn't do anything to deserve to be here. And I sure would like to get out. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I'll remember you. And he didn't. <laughs> and two years later, Pharaoh's troubled by two dreams. And there's no one amongst the magicians and the sorcerers in Pharaoh's household who could interpret the dreams. And that's when the, uh, the, the cupbearer has a snap to, oh, that's right, there's this guy in jail. <laughs> and I should have remembered him, but he can interpret dreams. Let me go get him. So he brings him before Pharaoh. And he tells Pharaoh, your dreams mean that there's going to be seven really good years of crops they're going to be followed by seven really bad years of famine. And here's what you need to do, Pharaoh. You need to put someone in charge of keeping, setting aside 20% of all the grain so that you can be prepared for the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh's like, man, you not only can interpret the dream, you've got a solution to the problem. I think you're the man. And you'll see that this phrase, the man, is all throughout chapter 43. And so, na- so now Joseph in, is in charge And the seven years of productivity have happened. Now we're a couple years into the seven years of famine. And here comes Joseph's brothers who are starving where they're at, coming to Egypt like the rest of the world was doing, to buy grain. And so, but Joseph was expecting them. And so he's already had a couple meetings with them. And uh, you'll see what happens here today. So Eugene, how are you doing this morning? Good, good. We're we're glad you're here, and you're going to read God's word for us. So follow along on the screen as Eugene reads aloud for us. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was in answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety 
from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came down to the lodging, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put money, who put our money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when they had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they, sh that they should eat bread there. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, your servant, our father is well, he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves. Because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn, according to his birthright and the youngest, according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, this is your word, and we believe it to be true. We believe it is from you. We don't think that these are just old stories for Sunday school children. These are for generations to come. This is your divine word that we need to learn from. And we also believe that all this points to Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to see Christ in this chapter and Lord, I just thank you that you do teach us and that you're here to help us. I thank you for a church that loves your word, and may it always be exalted. And so we pray that you'd guide us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. So this chapter is about a reunion of brothers, and this is a true story of two boys who were separated at birth. James McAllen and his brother John McAllen were identical twins, separated at birth. They moved to different states. But it really gets really weird from there. As boys, they both had a dog named Toy. That's a weird name, okay, for a dog. And then they both chose to move to Florida. They both married a wife named Linda. They both got divorced. They both got remarried and married a wife named Betty. They both had sons. They named their sons James Allen. 
One was James, it was Alan, A-L-A-N. The other one was A-L-L-A-N. I mean, the Quint, they both drew, drove Ford blue pickup trucks. I mean, the coincidences are off the chart. And then they discovered one another, and they met, and they could not believe all the coincidences that these two brothers had in this, in this reunion. Well, chapter 43 is about a reunion of brothers, but there's not that many coincidences here. Joseph is very different than his brothers at this point. So we're going to divide this chapter into four sections. First of all, there's a, and I'm, I had fun with the alliteration here, so go along with me. There's a family feud over food, and then there is the big brother bargains for Benjamin. Say that five times fast. And then there's presents, parties, paranoia, and peace. And then the fourth point is the band of brothers back together. So let's start with the family feud. There's a famine in the land. And it's interesting how short this verse is. Now, chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. They were given us, to us in the 16th century to help us follow along. So you could say, like in the Bible, you know, they'll say, well, in a certain place in Isaiah, <laughs> they couldn't say chapter 53, verse 4, but we have that tool, and it's a great tool, but they're not inspired. But sometimes the translators do break up verses in a way to help you. This, this verse is so short because they want you to just stop and think about this. What's going on here? We as a spoiled Americans, we don't know what a famine is. Judging by me and many others in the room, we've never been short of food. <laughs> okay? We don't know what it's like to grow hungry. Now, there are parts of the world today where there is famine going on. And unfortunately, most of the starvation that's happening on planet Earth is not because of a shortage of food. It's because of politics. This group doesn't want to feed that group, and they steal the food from them, like in the Sudan. The Muslims are stealing food and depriving Christians and murdering them. And so there's all kinds of things that are, that are happening that, that are causing famine in this world today, but it's not like it is here. Here, and even archaeologists confirms that there was a worldwide drought. It was a weather pattern, and, and it, was, it wasn't just mild. It was severe. And so people are, are starving, and Jacob has sent his, brothers, his sons there, as we'll see here in a little bit. And so <clears throat> they had eaten grain, and they had brought from Egypt, because remember, Joseph sent them back with some. And so father said, now go again and buy us... This is really interesting. A little food? Why would they not want to buy a lot of food? We do, what we know about jokes, just, uh, Jacob is he's rich. He's very wealthy, and he has money to buy food, which is interesting. What about people who are poor? They're probably dying in this, this time and, and place. But is he optimistic? Is he being stingy? I think he's being stingy. I think he's being really tightwad with his money. He doesn't want to let it go. And he's, he's not the one that has to travel to Egypt. He's sending his sons to do it. So it's no bother for him to send them again, I guess. But Judah, now remember Judah, he is a sketchy dude, okay? He's the one that would not, one of his daughter-in-laws uh, was married to his son and the son died. And so another son came into the situation and he also died. And so in that culture, you have to have offspring. That's a big thing. It's a matter of survival. Widows don't go on Social Security. They have sons to take care of them in their old age. Well, she had no son. So she was going to be in a bad situation soon. And so Judah, as the father-in-law, it was his responsibility to make sure that someone married her. And he, kept, he had another son that could have married her, but he kept procrastinating. He said, well, let's wait till he's older. Let's wait till he's older and putting it off. And so she finally realized, I see what's happening here. You're not going to do this, are you? So she tricks him, and this is an evil plot on her part and his, two evil people getting together. She disguises herself as a prostitute. He goes into her, and she conceives. And so then the family, three months later, see that she's showing, and they're like, uh, you know your daughter-in-law? She's been playing the role of a whore. You, you know what the rule is and the law is here. And he brings her in, and he's really harsh. He says, we need to stone her. And she says, well, the man that made me pregnant, these things belong to him. Here's, does this look familiar, Judah? Because he had put down a deposit with his rod and his chain and his insignia ring, and he was busted right in front of everybody. And he, and he had a little bit of a change of heart. Well, here's the guy that's speaking up, who's had this sketchy background, and he says, the man. And it's funny, 13 times in chapters 42, 43, 44, and 45, it refers to Joseph now as the man. I kind of think, I wonder if this is where that phrase comes from. Remember back in the 60s, they talk about working for the man? 
talking about a boss or a supervisor. I'm not sure if that's where it comes from or not, but it'd be a good etymology study. He said, he solemnly, he strictly warned us saying, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Which brother is that talking about? Benjamin. So since Jacob lost his favorite son, he thought he died, but he's down in Egypt, Joseph. He's adopted Benjamin as his new favorite son. He really treats him, it's, it, it's just way out of proportion. He treats the others with total disrespect. Why, let me ask you a question since we're interacting this morning. Why is Benjamin, what does he have in common with Joseph that would make him the favorite? Right, yes. And they, they were brothers from the same mom. And Rachel, he had four wives. Rachel was his favorite wife. You can see how polygamy and favoritism really make for a dysfunctional family. And so he, uh, he said, he's like, Dad, you're telling us to go down there and buy grain. We can't. He made it very clear. He won't even talk to us about food unless we bring Benjamin with us. So he said, if, they said, if you will send our brother with us, we will go down. You do your part. We will do ours. And if you will not, then we're not going. So prior to this, you see the brothers are very obedient, very submissive, but now they're like drawing a line. They're basically saying, Dad, we're not doing this anymore. We're not playing this game. If you're not going to do your part, we're not going to do ours. And so Israel say, why did you treat me so badly? And of course, it's all about who with Jacob? Me. It's all about me. Everything's about him. I mean, poor Simeon's in prison. And what are they, why haven't they gone back sooner? They waited till they're hungry again, while Simeon could be rotten in jail. Who knows what's happening to Simeon down there? And everybody's starving, but he's like, oh, poor me. You've treated me so badly. Why did you tell the man that, I ha- that you even had another brother? And Jacob <clears throat> suggesting that the son, so Jacob suggesting that the sons should have lied. Why did you even tell him the truth? See, here's one liar telling his sons to lie. It's not exactly good parenting, is it? <laughs> you know, I've heard stories of parents who, when their kids say, man, I have this school activity today, but I'm scheduled to work at Chick-fil-A today, and the parent will tell them, well, why don't you just call in sick? I'm like, are you serious? You're the parent, and you're going to tell your kids to lie, and then you're going to be shocked when they're 17 and they lie to you about where they've been all night. You, parents, the best thing we can do is teach our kids honesty. I believe they learned this deceit from their dad is why they've been lying all along. They lied about how Joseph died, right? I think they learned that from dad. Jacob's been quite the manipulator. And what's really interesting is keep reminding ourselves that this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of the chosen people of God, and look what clowns they are. It's crazy. And I'm not trying to disrespect them. What I'm trying to show is all throughout the Old Testament, God is showing us here's broken people, but I still love them. Here's broken people, but I still use them. Here's broken people, but I'm going to bring a Messiah to you, to you through them. He said that the man questioned us carefully. I mean, he was very intense, Joseph was, with his interrogation about ourselves, about our kindred, saying, is your father still alive, was one of the questions. And then, do you have another brother? What we told him when the answer to these questions, could we have any way known? Dad, how should we have known that he was going to tell us, I'm going to keep your brother now? Dad, we have no way of knowing. You are being totally unreasonable. You're being totally emotional. You're not thinking logically at all because you're so obsessed with your favorite child. Let me ask you a question. This is where you need to, we all need to do some introspection. What is it that we're so in love with that we can't even think straight? I, I coach basketball, and I haven't met a parent yet who sees that their, their son or, and I've coached girls too, but, or their daughter, is as bad as they are. <laughs> They're like, oh, my kid's really good, whatever. And they're just on and on about how great their kid is. And I've yet to had a parent come in and say, you know what, here's my son, he wants to play basketball, but I'll just be honest with you, he stinks. <laughs> they don't do it. We are, we, we're not very objective people. We're very biased, and we bring our biases into all kinds of situations that really make us look bad. And what's really um, a challenge is when we bring our biases to Scripture and we read the Scripture and we refuse to see what's in the mirror, that what's wrong with us. So we, let's try not to be like Jacob in this situation. They're like, Dad, there's no way we could have known this. You're really being uh, difficult here. And so what you're seeing here is what happens, and some of you may be dealing with this, the role reversal in parent-child relationship. 
How many of you have kind of gone through that? Where your parents are older, now you have to kind of be the parent and make the decision. Yeah, several of you have done that. It's not easy. It is not easy at all. In fact, what we see here is that, that the sons had to reason with this elderly dad, and they had to draw a hard line. And some of you have to do that, when this role reversal with the parent-child. The Bible doesn't say in, the, in the, the Ten Commandments, obey your parents. It says, honor your parents. Now, when you're a child, that includes obedience. But when you become an adult, you're not necessarily obeying them, but you, you are honoring them. And that is a lifetime command. As long as they're alive, you are to honor them. But when there's that role reversal and they are unable to care for themselves completely and you have to step in, you need to sometimes draw a loving but hard line. And this is what the guys are doing here with Jacob. So next we see big brother bargains for Benjamin. So Judah says, send the boy with me and we will rise and go. And this is a, this is a big change of heart. Jacob, Judah has been totally irreverent and, uh, and selfish and all this, but now he's saying, hey, I'm willing to step up. Just he and I will go down. He's not even including the other brothers. He said that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones, that we want all of our grandkids to survive, so I'm willing to go down and make the trip so that all of us survive. Now, Judah, again, he was the one who suggested that we sell Joseph into slavery. He, and then he's the one who disgraced the family by sleeping with Bilhah, his daughter-in-law, who was posed as a prostitute. And evidently, there's been a big change here. We're seeing the, um, um, some repentance going on. And all of this is being brought about because Joseph is testing them. Jo Joseph is making life purposely difficult to see, will they really change? Do I really want to reunite with these guys? Have they had a change of heart? And it, so it's interesting here that Judah suggests this and his offer is accepted. But last week we saw where Reuben says, hey, Reuben being a total knucklehead says, dad, if I don't bring him back, you can kill my two sons. I will prove to you how good I'll take care of your son by killing my two sons. What? Are you crazy? Reuben is ridiculous here. And that's why his offer is rejected. But Judah's offer here is he puts himself on the line and his offer is accepted. And of course, we know that Jesus comes from the tribe of the lion of Judah. So here, Judah starts off really sketchy, lots of problems, but now we're seeing a transformation. He's becoming more Christ-like. He's becoming to the point where God can use him and his offer here to be the one who put himself in the line, like Jesus did for us, is the one that's being accepted. He said, I will be a pledge of his safety. Interesting play on words here. What did the prostitute ask for when he was with her? A pledge. And he used his power then for selfish means, but now he's using a pledge for unselfish means. Further evidence that total change is taking place in him. Not, I shouldn't say total, but more change is take, taking place with him. So, verse 10 says, if we had not delayed, Dad, we could have been there and back twice. You know, the, the, the problem that we're in right now is not good. In fact, and again, what's not even mentioned in this whole situation is Simeon. Simeon is in jail, and nobody's done anything to go back and get him. And it says, then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land. Now, this is interesting. They're in a famine. And the choice fruits, it's not really, it's pretty much trail mix, okay? It's not really that, that impressive of a list here. Look at this. Take this to the man. Balm, honey, gum. I don't know if it was double mint or spearmint gum. I don't know which one. I... I think it was double mint because he had two dreams, right? And the, jail, the guys in jail had two dreams and Pharaoh had two dreams. So I think it was double mint gum. Yeah, it gets worse. Anyway, there's myrrh, pistachio, love those, nuts, almonds. He's basically saying, hey, can you put a gift basket together and take some trail mix to the Pharaoh? Here's the man who has everything, but they don't have much, okay? What's also interesting is this. Um, when Joseph was sold into slavery back in chapter 37, the caravan that was taking imports to Egypt, guess what? They were taking a lot of these things here. So this was stuff they didn't have in Egypt. So it was kind of a treat, but it wasn't like really expensive because again, they're in a famine. So Joseph, once again, is using gift giving before his, like he did with his brother Esau. Remember when 
He had fled from Esau because Esau wanted to kill him because he stole his, his, the, his birthright. And so then there was this reunion and he's sending out all these gifts and all these children and everything like that in front of him because he, he's trying to bribe him into that. And once again, he's using gift giving. Now, sometimes gift giving is strategic and it's, it's a godly thing to do. Um, in Proverbs, it says that a man's gift makes rooms for him and brings him before great men. So it's a courteous thing to do. Someone invites you over for dinner, you bring over a little flower arrangement or you bring over dessert or something like that. It's a nice gesture. Sometimes gift giving is a good thing. Sometimes it's manipulation. With Jacob, I'm not really sure right now because his heart is still changing. But in the past, it's been definitely about manipulation. So he, he says, I want you to take double the money with you. Why is that? Because their money was, remember, they paid for it, but then the money was right back in their sacks of grain. And that's when they thought, that's another reason we don't want to go back because they'll say, hey, you guys didn't even pay last time you were here. And so... Um, but he, he says, so take that money back and then take more money to buy grain with you. So double the money here. He said, maybe, maybe it's just the whole thing was an oversight that they put the money back in your bags. This also is a good thing to do. One time I was at McDonald's. This is not me. But anyway, I was at McDonald's and I paid for food. And the girl gave me basically all my money back in change and more. And I'm looking at it and I'm walking away going, Wait a minute. And I, this, I kid you not. I went back to say, hey, uh, I gave you, I can't remember exactly, I gave you this much, but you gave me this much back. I said, here, this is, this is not mine. I said, you only owe me this much. And she just looked at me like, are you crazy? Who in their right mind would bring money back? You had a chance to walk out with free food and more money than you gave me. And seriously, it wasn't like, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you being honest, like some people have done at other times. She looked at me like, what kind of crazy person would bring money back? You know what kind of crazy person brings money back? A Christian. Someone who follows Jesus. If that ever happens to you, if there's ever a situation where there's a mistake made in your favor, you need to speak up. You need to be honest because it will come back on you if you don't. I'll never forget when Tammy and I bought the house over here in Springfield. We went to closing. And I kid you not. We put money down on the house. We went to closing, and they slid across the table a check for $17,000 and said, here, this is the, the yours, and this is this. I'm like, what is this about? And they said, well, that's your, I don't know, it came out of the escrow or whatever. I'm like, this is, this is not what we want. This is not what we put up. We put up this much, and they're like, oh, sorry, our mistake. I could have taken that bank that check. Now, they would have caught that later. I'm sure they would have caught that. I mean, if they have any accountants worth their salt. But those are the things you, you need to do to be honest, upright, because God is watching, even if nobody ever else is. So when someone makes a financial oversight, God is giving you an opportunity to demonstrate Christian honesty. Don't just say, oh, look at me. I came out ahead. I got free McDonald's. And No, God is saying, hey, here's a chance. Show them what, what, what Christ followers do. So he says, and, and, and you can see him like, take this, take double the money, and all right, Take your brother also, and it's killing him to do this, and go to, again, the man. And he's, this is where Jacob is showing that he still is spiritually alive. He said, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send you back your other brother and Benjamin. Your other brother? He, he doesn't have a name? He can't even call him Simeon? He hasn't been missing him or grieving over him. Just, yeah, and by the way, when you bring back the food, bring back your, whoever that other brother is down there, and, and make sure you bring back Benjamin. Oh, he's my favorite. Man, Jacob is so up and down. Jacob is like the, the, new, the Old Testament version of Peter. One minute, Peter's like, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And next thing, Jesus is saying to him, get behind me, Satan. Shut your mouth, Peter. You keep talking trash. You know, up and down and up and down. Um... Can anybody in this room relate to those two guys besides me? <laughs> One Sunday I'm preaching the gospel. I'm telling people how to be saved. Next thing I'm having an argument with my wife. Not that it's ever her fault. And then next thing you know, I'm selfish. Next thing you know, I'm giving. And I'm like up and down, up and down. And, and there are days I pray, Lord, would you just come and put an end to this, Gary? <laughs> and just let me be the Gary that you want me to be to where I'm not doing this struggle up and down. Jacob really is a picture not of, of two things. He's a picture of Israel. Read the Old Testament. 
Israel's on fire for God. Israel's worshiping pagan you know, idols. Israel repents, and God blesses them, and they're conquering armies. Then you know, Israel's mingling with prostitutes. And Israel's up and down. The country's up and down. Jacob's a picture of that, and he's also a picture of you and me. We're up and down. We're up and down. We are far, far from perfect. The Christian life is a struggle, but it's like Proverbs says, the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. No matter how many times you fall, get back up. One of the most... Um, Sad things I hear from people, like when they fall, whether it's morally or spiritually or whatever, and they stop going to church for a while, and then I reach out to them and say, hey, we miss you, we love you, you know, come on back. They're like, oh, it'd be embarrassing. Everybody's going to think I'm just some bad person when I walk in. And I'm like, has that ever happened at this church? We, we've, some of you have been here for 10 years, okay? And you've seen people walk in the door we have not seen in years, does anybody look at them and say, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> have that ever happened? Not that we're perfect, okay? Some of you have been on that receiving end of that, where you haven't been here for a long time, and as soon as you walk in the door, it's not just, hey, how are you? It's, it's hugs and kisses, and we're so glad you're here. And it's not like, where have you been? You know? But Satan will tell you, oh, man, you can't go back now. That'll be embarrassing. They're going to wonder why you haven't been there for so long. You know, It's family. It's family. You know, you've all been to the family reunions. You've got the weird Aunt Sally. You've got all kinds of crazy people. But you're family. You love each other. You stick together. That's what God's people do. He says, as for me, and Jacob's now accepting this, the guy who's been the master manipulator, right? Manipulated his dad, manipulated his brothers, manipulated Laban, manipulated his wives. He's now not in control. He's old. There's a famine. Everything is, he's losing control of everything. And he says, hey, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. So, so be it. It is what it is, as people would say today. He's accepting the sovereignty of God. God has created desperate circumstances to teach Jacob to trust him and to lean upon his mercy. And you know what? God does that with you and me. We can look at difficult times and say, why is this happening? And we can have our little two-year-old temper tantrum, or we can say, wait a minute, what is God teaching me? What is he trying to show me? Is there some way in my life I need to lean on God more and to trust him more? Think about God has literally, literally rearranged world history and caused a worldwide famine to change the heart of at least one man, and especially this one man, Jacob. So that brings us to the next point, presence, party, paranoia, and peace. So the men took the present, this gift bag, basket of trail mix, and they took double the money with them, and they arose, and they went down to Egypt. Remember, all, almost always when you read the Bible, it's always down to Egypt, because not only is it geographically south, geographically lower in elevation, it means spiritually going downhill. Egypt's a picture of the world. They're having to go to the world to survive here. And so when Joseph saw Benjamin, so Joseph's probably up on a higher level. He's overseeing this grain distribution operation, and he sees the brothers walk in, but this time he sees Benjamin. He has not seen Benjamin in 20 years, okay? Benjamin, they're six years apart. And so Benjamin was 11 the last time they saw him when Joseph was 17. But he recognizes him, and he said to the steward, the guy who's managing his household, he says to the guy who used to be doing his job, remember, uh, Joseph was the steward of Potiphar's house, and now he has a guy just like him that he trusts running everything for him. He says to the steward of his house, bring those men into the house and slaughter an animal, okay? Foreshadow of the prodigal son. What happens when the prodigal son comes home? They kill the fatted calf. They're going to have a big feast. Eating meat was not a regular thing. We have meat with every meal, just about, unless you're a vegan. And sorry for that if you're missing out on that. But anyway, we eat meat with almost every meal. That was rare in this day and age, and it's rare in most parts of the world. Lots of people don't have meat. That's extremely rare. But so to kill an animal for a feast was a big, big deal. It was like Thanksgiving on steroids. And it said, make ready, and the men are to dine with me at noon. Think back the last time Joseph was present when they had a meal. Where was Joseph? He's in the dried well while they're having lunch. 
And now Joseph's going to be nearby while they're having lunch again. It's kind of, there's irony written in here that Moses is writing for us to understand. So when was the last time that the brothers ate a meal together with Joseph nearby? Is when they were wanting to sell him into slavery. So he's, I think he's trying to remind them of this. <clears throat> and in this culture, the Egyptian culture, the noon meal was the big meal. In our culture, the evening meal is the big one, but this culture, the noon one was. And part of that was because of the, cl the climate. You know, from about 11 to 2, it was too hot to do anything. So you came inside, you took time and had a big meal then. Then you went back to work when it cooled off and you worked as long as you could into the evening. And the, the, set, the third meal was something that was really uh, just do before you go to bed because we're going to work until it gets dark. So the man did as Joseph told him and bought, brought the men to Joseph's house. And Joseph's house, archaeologists think, was adjacent to Pharaoh's house. And that would make sense for him being the prime minister. And the men were afraid. You get invited to dinner, to a great meal, they're going to kill an animal for you, and you're scared. Why? It's interesting. Let's look into it and find out why. Because they were, here's why. Because they, were, they brought to Joseph's house and they said, oh, it's because of the money. He's going to bring us to his house. Because remember, we, the money was back in our sacks and we didn't bring it back. We've been gone for, for a long time. And we never brought the money back, but we have it back now, but maybe it's too late. And it was this money that was replaced in our sacks the first time that we brought in, so that he may, watch, watch these words here and see if this doesn't sound really familiar, that he may assault us, fall upon us, and make us servants or slaves. What's that sound like? That's what they did to him. Chapter 37 says they fell upon him, they beat him, they threw him in a pit, and they sold him into slavery. It's crazy how it's all, history comes around, you reap what you sow. And then there's this really bizarre thing, I think it's thrown in there for funniness here, and he wants to steal our donkeys. <laughs> Here's the guy who's the second in command of the most powerful empire on the planet, and he wants to steal your donkeys, that's what he's in it for. He, he tricked us and invited us to lunch so he could steal our donkeys, that's what it is. That's just crazy, I just thought it was he just threw, the Bible threw it in there for humor. But they're invited to lunch. They should be seeing this as a good thing. The most powerful man on the planet who's in charge of grain distribution to feed the world is inviting you to lunch, and you're afraid. And you think, well, it's because of that. Well, here, Proverbs tells us some wisdom about this. It says the wicked, the guilty, the sinner flees, runs when no one pursues him. Nobody's after you, and you're running. It's a, called a guilty conscience. You see, when we're guilty of something and we think we got this little secret and then someone talks about it and says, well, how are you doing today? Well, what did wife ask me about that? You know, well, did you go to the store? Oh, what? And we get all guilty about things because our conscience bothers them. They, they're not even chasing you. They're not, they're not trying to interrogate you or anything, but your guilty conscience is bothering you. Today, what our culture calls anxiety, which it's, uh, the CDC Center for Disease Control talks about how anxiety is like on the rise, especially with female girls ages 14 to 24, just like tripling anxiety. But I think the Bible has better words for it. It's often the suppression of a guilty conscience. You see, because this culture denies sin, therefore they deny guilt. They say that guilt is all because of a social construct, and you ignore that. And forget all these social moral stereotypes. You be you and do whatever you want to do. And if you feel guilty, it's just because culture is making you feel guilty. But their mind and their body is still screaming, something is wrong with me. What I'm doing is not right. And something deep down inside is telling you, this is wrong. This is not the way God designed me. This is not what God wanted me to be. God didn't want me to have a really high body count by the time I'm 40. God wasn't looking for all those things. And there's a reason. You can call it anxiety. The Bible calls it guilt. That's the bad news. The good news is there's a cure for guilt. And that's Jesus Christ. He can forgive sin. And what did he say to the woman taking adultery? He said, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. If you want to get out of this anxiety trap you're in, repent and don't do it anymore. That, that was the solution. Don't try to change culture. Try to change your heart. Like, I'm not saying culture is always right. I'm talking about when culture is right. So have you noticed that liars think that everyone's lying to them? Have you ever noticed that thieves think that everyone is stealing from them? And that Cheaters think that their spouse is cheating on them and that judgmental people think everybody's judging them. That's what the Bible tells us, that, that 
those who judge are doing the same sin. So then when they went up to the steward of, of Joseph's house, the guy in charge, they spoke with him at the door, and they're trying to figure out, what's this lunch thing all about? Is it really a trap? And they said, oh, my Lord, we came down the first time we came. We just, all we wanted to do was buy food. You accused us of being spies, but we just really just wanted to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place on our way home, we opened our sacks, and there's our money back in the bag. And honest, it was a mistake. So in the math of the sack is our money. It's in full weight, everything. So we have brought it again with us. And again, the question is, if they really wanted to be honest, what took so long? There's two reasons they should have came back right away. They should have came back with the money and said, hey, hey, there's been a mistake. We paid for grain, and now you put the money back in. And also, we, we need to come back for our brother. But they've been gone for a long time, not returning the money, and not caring a whit about Simeon. And says, we brought other money down with us to buy food. We don't know who put the money in our sacks. And he, the steward, said, calm down, guys. <laughs> Peace. Don't be afraid. Does that sound familiar? How many times did Jesus say, peace, do not be afraid? Angels came and said, peace, do not be afraid. And so this steward is acting like an angel or acting like Christ. And in fact, let me go one step farther. And again, I don't want to make a strong case for this, but I think it hints towards this. Remember when Abraham sent Eliezer to find a wife for his son? And that, in that case, that servant was a very clear picture of the Holy Spirit. I think this same servant here is also a picture of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if we can make a strong case for it, but just wanted to plant that seed into your thinking. But he says to them, peace, don't be afraid. <clears throat> In the Bible, there are two types of peace. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace, everybody say the two words, with God. There's peace with God, and that comes through Jesus Christ. You see, before you are born again or saved or come into a relationship with Christ, whatever term you want to put on it, the Bible calls you an enemy of God. You, God's laying down laws and you're breaking them. God's saying, hey, this is my world, and you're saying, no, it's not. This is my life. I will do what I want to do. You've declared yourself an enemy with God, and the only way that this war can end and there be peace between the two parties is for one party to surrender and to give their life to Christ, and then you are made right with God. Jesus Christ brings you as the mediator to God the Father and says, let there be peace between these two parties and that there no longer be enemies. And peace in the Bible is not just the absence of war. It means you go from being the enemy of God to being his favorite son to where he loves you and puts the robe on you, and he loves you like, there's, like no one else. He loves you like he loves Christ. <clears throat> And, but Colossians 3.15 talks about a different type of peace. It says, and let the, read this with me, peace of God rule in your heart. So there's peace with God, but then there's the peace of God. Once you have peace with God and you're in good standing in relation with him, then you can experience the peace of God. And it says that peace rules in your hearts. It's interesting, the word rule here is the Greek word umpiro, where we get our English baseball word what? Umpire. <clears throat> what does an umpire do? He says it's fair or it's foul, that it's safe or it's out. He tells you basically what's right or wrong. So we have the word of God to tell us what's right and wrong. But there's some situations like, well, do I go to this college or this college? And that's where the peace of God is the umpire in your heart to tell you, hey, do this, don't do that. And the closer we walk with God, the more sensitive we are to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and the more we can say, you know what? I have a peace about this. This is the right thing to do. And I know there's believers in this room. You've told me where you thought about <clears throat> buying this car or taking this job or dating this person, and you just didn't have a peace about it. Something didn't seem right. And then sure enough, a few months later, like, man, I'm so glad I didn't do that. And that's the peace of God ruling in your life. Well, <clears throat> this is where this steward is saying, blessing this peace upon them. And then, listen to the words of this steward. He's an Egyptian. How many gods does he have? A lot, okay? At least 10 primary gods that the 10 plagues were for. But he's got lots of gods. But there's been a change. He's been working for the man. He's been working for Joseph. And I really believe that Joseph has converted this guy because he, he says, here's what happened, guys. You, there wasn't an accident with your money. Your God and the God of your father. 
how does he know Jacob? Joseph's told him. And he says he put the treasure back in check. God has orchestrated it to where the money was put back. But when God does things, what does he use? He uses people. And watch what he says next. He says, I received your money. I got your money. He's basically saying, God used me to put the money back in your bags. And then he brought out Simeon. They haven't even asked for Simeon. He's given them more than they asked for. <coughs> um, why was Simeon chosen to stay behind? Joseph chose him. But if you remember, remember Simeon and Levi went through the one town of Canaanites and killed all the men? I think this is like his prison time where he thought maybe he got away from it, but that's speculation. So let's, we've, we've talked about the family feud over food. Then Judah steps up as big brother bargaining for Benjamin. You see the presents, this meal, this party. They're paranoid about it, but then they're given peace. Brings us to our final point. The band of brothers are back together. So the man brought the men in Joseph's house, gave them water, and what? Wash their feet. Does that sound familiar? Here's a big meal. How many people are present? Twelve brothers plus Joseph makes 13. When's the last meal where feet were washed, where 13 men were present? Right? Right? The last supper. So this is a foreshadow of that as well, but I'll get to that in a second. They prepared the present, this, the, the gift basket full of trail mix for Joseph coming at noon because they heard that they're going to have this bread there. Bread's a generic word for food. And so Joseph came and they brought into the house with him the present and they, and they bowed down. They bowed down before. This is the second time. Next week we'll read about the third time. And does this sound familiar? Joseph's dreams. How many times did the sun, moon, and stars bow down? Three times. How many times did the grain of stalks bow down? Three times. So this is being fulfilled specifically, and God's prophecies always come true. And he inquired about their welfare. Hey, guys, how's it going? And he said, so the inquiry about the welfare is not the question about the dad. He says, hey, guys, so he has small talk. How's it going? Here's the most powerful man in the world, except for Pharaoh, and he's having small talk with these guys. I'm sure they're totally scared. And he says, and is your father, is your dad doing good, the old man? You know, obviously he was a hippie saying, hey, how's your old man doing? And he says, whom you spoke, is he still alive? I think Joseph's saying, I hope my test didn't backfire. I've been putting these guys and their dad through the mill. Maybe dad has had a heart attack by now because I've stressed him out so much. So is he still alive? And they said, your servant, our father is well. He is still alive. And Joseph's in the inside like, Whew, good, okay, we're okay so far. And then it says they bowed their heads and they prostrated. That means they laid flat on the floor, not just on their knees. Now they're flat on the floor before him, still nervous, still scared. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw his brother Benjamin, his full brother, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother? He wants to confirm it because he saw him before. Of whom he spoke to me, he said, God, be gracious to you, my son. And he doesn't mean literally his son, it's a young man. Bob, God be gracious to you, young man. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. You've been sold into slavery. You've been falsely accused. You're in prison. For 20 plus years, you're away from your family and all that. And then you've seen these other brothers who were jerks to you, but the one brother you really loved who loved you, you haven't seen until now. This has got to be a very emotional experience for Joseph. So Joseph, he just runs out of the room, just gets out, goes into that door right over there, just he can't take it anymore. And, and he's not hiding, he's trying to hide his emotions, but he, he just walks out and they're like, was it something we said? <laughs> Is he fixing to go get the soldiers to come in and kill us? I'm sure they're nervous again. But all of this happened because of compassion, that he had that warm, fizz, fuzzy feeling for his brother, literally here, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and he wept there. Okay? Not just tears. This is, when the Bible says in Hebrew, wept, it means you can hear them. This, he is crying out loud in a very shaken, troubled way. So then he washes his face because Egyptian men wore mascara, right? So he's got to wash the mascara that's running off. And, it, and he came out, he's controlling himself. He's saying, okay, serve the food. He's trying to go back to the gruff exterior where he's um, uh, trying to play the tough guy again even though deep down inside he's tender-hearted Joseph. 
And it says, and they served him by himself. So there's three tables here. Joseph's at one table, but all the food's on his table. His brothers are at this table, and then the Egyptians are at this table. So they served him by himself, and then them by themselves, and then the Egyptians who ate by themselves. And of course, why were the Egyptians eating? The Egyptians did because they could not eat with Hebrews because that was an abomination. It was against their religion to sit at the same table. Ironically, Jews would have the same thing later under Moses and not eat with Gentiles, <clears throat> but they thought that was just disgusting. So they sat at these, these three tables here, and it means they were seated. And here's what's interesting. The way that they were seated was in birth order. One, two, three, four. Now you say, well, Gary, that's easy. Look how old they are. No, remember, I had four different mothers. Some of these guys were born right around the same time. And of course, this is 20-some years later. People age differently. So if you took 10 people you didn't know and you put them in birth order, the odds of you getting that right accidentally is 1 in 3 million. Now, we could bring it down to 1 in 2 million because some definitely look a little older than others, but there's got to be uh, some that are very difficult. But it was enough to impress them. They were totally amazed. Like, how did he know? How did he know Reuben was the oldest and... Benjamin being the youngest, that might have been easy, but he's got all of us exactly in order. This is, this is crazy. Um, so the portions were taken from Joseph's table. Again, he's got the main banquet table. He's the only one seated there. And they're taking all the food and distributing it to the two other tables. But when they serve Benjamin, they put five times as much food on his plate, okay? I mean, it looks like Golden Corral times 10 right here. And he's just all this food right here, five times as much as hungry grown men would eat, okay? Now, in some cultures, you would give a double portion to the guest of honor. I think it was the, the Hisoks, who were the ones who conquered Egypt. They would do four times as much. Joseph's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to top them. I'm going to go five times as much. And so they drank, and they were merry with him. And the word merry literally means they were intoxicated, okay? They, they, probably had, they were so relaxed and had so much fun, they drank a little bit too much. What a major change from we're going to kill our brother to now we're having a good time with our brother, but the thing is, they don't know it's him. They don't know it's him. Here's another picture in this. <clears throat> seven good years, seven bad years. They, don't, they reject him, then they don't recognize him, but next week we see that they will recognize him again. You know what this is? This is a picture of Israel again. Israel rejected Christ when he came to earth and he died for our sins. Israel has been prosperous here in the last, uh, since 1948, but Israel will go through seven years of tribulation, and so will the planet, and then Christ will come again, and they'll realize the Messiah they had missed, and they will recognize him like they recognize, they'll recognize Joseph next week. Can you think of another time, and I've already asked you this, when 13 men are gathered at a meal and they have their feet washed? It's when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. And Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he humbled himself. He did the job of a slave. And he washed the feet of the disciples. And Peter said, Lord, no, 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 don't wash my feet. He said, no, if I don't do this, you will have no part in my kingdom. And he said, well, then, hey, wash my whole body. And he said, well, there's no need to do that. You've already been washed. You've already been saved. But when we're out there traveling in the world, our feet get dirty. So I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to cleanse those things. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, it says, The Son of Man came not to serve, but be served, and to give his life as a ransom. When a ransom is paid, the person is made completely free. There's nothing else that has to be done. When Christ paid the price for your sins on the cross, he paid the ransom. If you will trust in him and receive that gift, then you are made free. But you're free to do what? To serve yourself? No, it's free to serve others. That's what Paul tells the Galatian church. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity to serve yourself and your own flesh, but use it as an opportunity to serve one another in love. You see, when we sin, basically what we're doing is saying, God, get off the throne. I am in charge of my life. I will do what I want. I will go to college where I want to go to college. I will choose my career. I'll choose my spouse. I will get up. I'll do what I want, eat what I want, spend my money how I want. And that's sin. That's the definition of sin because God is the one that's supposed to be in control. 
But God has forgiven our sin, and salvation is God taking the place of man. You see, instead of us being on the throne and kicking God off, we should put him on the throne. And instead of Jesus being on the cross, that should have been Gary on the cross. So salvation is realizing I'm a sinner. I should not be in control of my own life. I give control of my life to Jesus because he gave his life for me. And that all my sins, all my guilt can be forgiven by trusting in him. Have you made that decision? Romans chapter 10 says, if you, you personally, will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, I will make Jesus the Lord of my life. And I do believe in my heart that God raised from the dead. He died, was buried, he rose again. Read the last part with me. You will be saved. Saved from what? From eternity without Christ. And you will be saved to eternity with Christ. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful chapter. Thank you that we see Christ in Joseph and that this, this is all a foreshadow of what he's done for us. Father, I thank you that you loved us in spite of who we are and what we've done. I thank you that you take us from a deep, dark place and you exalt us up there with Christ, not because we deserve it. We definitely, definitely do not. But you love us because that's who you are. And Father, if there's one here today who's never trusted Christ, I pray that they would make that decision before they leave here today to put their full faith and trust in Christ. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. If you are, if you've either made a decision for Christ or maybe you're not there yet because you still have questions, man, there's my number. Call me, text me. I'll take out the coffee, the lunch, whatever. We'll talk and we'll answer whatever questions you have about the gospel. Um, Sophia, would you come help me with a question and answer session here? So um, if you have a question, you feel free to text that in right now if you want. I think some have already come in. And you, it could be a question pretty much about anything. All right. There you go. You can use this microphone right here. There you go. To start with this one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. He says, I was listening to the Bible Project this morning, and they were talking about different translations of the Bible. They brought up the New American translation and another one that I can't remember. They also mentioned the NSV and ESV. Where do you stand with the newer translations that are being put out about the Bible, such as the New American translation? Um, I'd never heard of this one before. I've heard of the New American Standard Bible, or NASV or NASB, but this is just a New American translation. I haven't heard of that myself. So I don't speak hardly. Mi español es muy poquito. So if you were to ask me to translate what some, one, like half our congregation speaks Spanish or, some, or a good chunk of you do, um, if you were to say something in Spanish to ask me to translate, it would be a poor translation. If you were to ask Charles a translation, it would be a fairly good translation. If you were to ask Aureli Medina to translate, it would be a perfect translation because she speaks very fluent Spanish. So the, the translation depends upon the translator. That is no slight against the original about what's being said. The Word of God is perfect. Translations are not perfect because people are doing the translating. But let me just say this. Even, um, what's his name, Bart Ehrman, who is an outspoken atheist, says that the Bible is so well translated that there is nothing, no major doctrine that is being affected by the minor discrepancies. So some translations will, will translate it, you know, good, and some translations will translate it great. The difference between good and great is like this much. So there's nothing, there's nothing that should shake your faith in a, <clears throat> when you read different translations. <clears throat> but I will say this. So there's word-for-word -word translation, phrase-for-phrase, -phrase, and then thought-for-thought. -thought. You follow me here? If you do word-for-word, it becomes accurate, but it also becomes difficult to read because like in Spanish, you put the adjective behind the word and in English, you put the adjective in front of the word. <clears throat> so it'd be really interesting, to, like in English, we'd say, There's, there goes the white dog. But it's, if you were to translate from Spanish, you'd say, there goes the dog white. You'd be like, what? What are you talking about? So if you do word for word, it's going to be difficult to read. So the best translations will do phrase for phrase. And they'll, what are they trying to say and put conjugate the verbs the way in English that they would do it in that language, which is differently, so you've got to make it match in English. When you go thought for thought, then you go into what's called um, a paraphrase. The message is a paraphrase. The message, though, you're not really reading the Bible. It's like some of the verses, I'm not exaggerating, like, you know, 
Jesus was a hip dude and whatever. And I'm just like, okay, that's going too far, okay? You're just trying to tell me Jesus was great, but you're going way too far to do it. So I haven't heard of the New American Translation. I'll have to look into that. But we use the ESV here mostly. Other good translations are the New King James Version, which takes off the these and the thous, just makes it more readable, but tries to stay word for word like they did. ESV tries to go more phrase for phrase to use grammar uh, better. Um, if you want to read something that's more, even more modern English, where it's trying to go thought for thought, the New Living Translation is very good without compromising accuracy. There's some of them, though, like the, the, um, the, the CEV, the Contemporary English Version, it's not as bad as the message, but it gets a little too loosey-goosey with some of the language. So if you want to read something that's really readable, um, NLT, but if you want to read, in my opinion, the most accurate Bible that's around today is ESV, but we're not talking head and shoulders above other, other translations. We're talking about slightly. Okay, what other questions do you have? I think the other one's also about translations. Um, the, no, was there a part two uh, of that person? Uh, no, okay. I don't think so. Um, this was a, a separate question. It says, what would you say to someone who asks if you can lose your salvation? Man, great question. So <clears throat> there's three relationships that describe being a Christian. There's a birth. Jesus says you must be born again. Okay, there is a marriage, you know, we, we are married to Christ, Christ is the bridegroom, we are the bride, and we're married, and then there's the adoption. What's interesting is we're born of the Father, we're married to the Son, and we're adopted by the Spirit. See the Trinity working in salvation right there? All three are just different metaphors for the same transaction, and all three of those are meant to be permanent. Now, we mess up marriage by having divorce. But marriage is meant to be permanent. A birth is definitely permanent. So you were born into your family. Did you become your mother's child because you behaved so well? No. Your good works had nothing to do with it. She gave you life. Okay? In salvation, Christ gives you life. It's not based on your good works. So if your good works cannot get it, your good works cannot keep it. Just like a child doesn't say, uh, you know, misbehaves, and the parent says, oh, you're not my child anymore because you've been a bad boy. No. What do you do with wayward children? You don't disown them, you discipline them. And that's what God does for us. When, you become, when you're born again, and you have a second birth, which is your spiritual birth, and you accept Christ your Savior, God becomes your heavenly Father, and as Hebrews says, Jesus is our elder brother, okay? And we are in the family of God, if you misbehave, if you sin, God doesn't say, oh, you, you've lost it. He comes in and says, you better straighten up, <laughs> okay? And that's why Hebrews 12 talks about three levels of discipline. There's rebuke, chasten, and scourge. Rebuke is, ah, don't do that. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right, I shouldn't do it. And then uh, discipline or chasten is, you know, the smack on the wrist, something bad happens to you and God's trying to shake you up. And then scourge is when God takes you to the woodhouse and says, you know, if you don't get right soon, things are going to get even worse. Okay, but I do not believe you can lose your salvation because the Bible says you are sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. And then actually, Pastor Stan told me a really good one. The Bible also talks about the new birth as being a circumcision. You can't get uncircumcised. It's, once it's done, it's done. Okay, not to be too graphic there, but anyway. All right, what other questions? That was it. So. All right, good. Any other questions where someone wants to raise their hand? All right, that's, that's great. Um, so the problem with the Bible, and it's not a big problem, it's not that we're missing parts. It's we have a little bit too much, okay? So scribes who translated the Bible, and that was their full-time job, would often write notes in the side like to help understand it, but it was off to the side. But as they get copied and copied, sometimes they made their way in between the verses, and sometimes people thought they were part of the text. But none of them, none of them contradict the Bible, okay? <clears throat> it's kind of like um, the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, period. That was where it ended. But in those days, when people prayed a prayer, they always ended with, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen. That's the way, just like we say, in Jesus' name, amen. So when Matthew translated the Lord's Prayer, he added that but then some translations don't have it because it was just well they thought that's how people ended their prayers so they added it no contradiction whatsoever and we're talking about like we're talking about 
Less than half of 1% of the Bible is like footnotes included. Does that make sense? So that's why some translations include this verse and some don't. It's not because we're missing parts of the Bible. We actually have footnotes that, is this part of the Bible or is this a footnote? And that's where they disagree. But again, none of those footnotes contradict anything else in the passage. Okay? <clears throat> It'd be like if, yes, Bob, go ahead. I'm sorry, when Matthew was translated, thank you, Matthew didn't translate, Matthew wrote the Bible, when the Gospel of Matthew was translated, thank you for the correction there. Okay, um, Charles. Yes, um, Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, a good name is worth more than gold and silver and precious metal. Your reputation, even if you're homeless, <laughs> is worth more than and, and, and the ability to, like you said, put, put your head on the pillow at night and say, I know I'm not perfect, but I know I haven't stolen from anybody. I'm not lying to people because your conscience will bother you. And that's, that's the way you're designed. That's not a bad thing. God is trying to help you to live a good life, to be right. And that's why, <clears throat> um, that's why it's obvious that people are created in God's image. Animals don't wrestle with these issues. You know, they deceive each other all the time. They hide, they look, whatever they do, all that stuff. They, they just do what they do to survive. We're not here just to survive. We're here to be image bearers of God. And so a good name, a good reputation, a clear conscience, speaking the truth is, is worth more than any amount of money. Because you can go to bed at night, you can look people in the eye and know you're, you're, you've done the best you could do, with God's help, of course. All right, this, this is great. Let's stand. And we're going to read uh, a verse of scripture as our commission to go into the world. Matthew chapter 28, would you join me in verse 18? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed.